A couple more ways to achieve layout via CSS. Again, there's a whole bunch of them. You have a lot of choices. And the idea is, is that with all these choices, you, know, you should be able to find something that achieves the layout that you want, that matches your wireframe. And the next thing we're going to look at is called a grid layout. Now, a grid layout, um, when we talk about something being in a grid layout, we're talking about having a set of rows and columns. And this is very common in graphic design, where you have things arranged in rows and columns. And there's a ways to achieve it without using the grid layout, but the grid layout is certainly probably the easiest way to achieve that. And the grid layout works better when we have more things than what we've had in our example. So I'm going to pull another example down that I did in a previous semester. Let me just find it real quick. enable some of these things first of all. The other one that we're going to talk about is the CSS flex method. So let's see. If this is the example that I had in mind. Look at this one. Okay, here we go. And this is a, and we can't see it. This is a page that has a bunch of sections in it. And they're arranged in a grid, uh, believe it or not. A grid, again, is where you have a set of rows and columns. I posted a resource to Canvas just a minute ago that talks about the grid in more detail. So a grid like this is based on having 
rows and columns. In this case, there are two rows. Each row has three columns. That being said, you can rearrange stuff if you want to. You can rearrange stuff based on the line number, the row and column number. You can uh, rearrange things by having things go across multiple columns, like in this example. All right, and so on. So this is a very flexible method to use, all right, for defining anything where you have blocks that you want to arrange in rows and columns, even if those rows and columns aren't regular. All right, like let's look at this example. This is about the the most basic example that we can get, all right, where we have four things on the page and it's arranged in a grid, two rows, three columns. So if we look at this example, what we see is this. We see a wrapper around it. This is going to be one little piece of, C of, of HTML that we're going to need to add. The wrapper goes around the entire grid. So in this case, the wrapper goes around all six of these elements. So it's a div that contains all six of these elements. That just says that, hey, this is where the grid is. All right, these, everything inside of this is part of the grid. We then have anything with a class of box has a background color, a border radius, a padding, and so on. Now, when we define the grid, we define that the grid, the, the wrapper, has a display type of grid. So everything inside the wrapper is going to be in a grid. And there's going to be a gap of 10 pixels around each grid element. And there's going to be three columns. One column is going to be 100 pixels, so is the second, so is the third. So everything else rearranges itself from there. I'm going to go and save this code. So we can play with that. All right, so here, wherever I put it, is the code. on the desktop. I just didn't see it. Oh, here. All right. There is the example that we had before that we were looking at. But now we can go in and edit it. So I'm going to open it up and we can play with some of the parameters. If I make a bigger grid gap, it simply makes the space between them bigger. All right, spaces them out. If I make the template columns a bigger width, it will make the columns a bigger width. Simple enough. It makes them go across like that. I don't have to make them a uniform width. I can make them a different width. So I can make this one 100 pixels, this one 200 pixels. And it will resize them. I could also use percentages for this. So I could make this one 10%, this 30%, and this one 20%.
and then as I resize it, it will get smaller. All right. That's per about it for the basic grid, a basic regular grid. But we can also add on to it the ability for things to go over either multiple columns, span multiple columns, or span multiple rows. For example, let's say A was our header, and I wanted our header to go all the way across the page. All right. I could do something like this. So if I wanted this very first thing, let's close everything and just get to the example. If I wanted A to go all the way across the page, I could say A grid row, column, 1 to 4. Yeah, you're right. Okay, what am I? Grid column start and grid column end. And then if we look at this. There you go. It goes all the way across. Now the one thing that's a little weird with this is that notice that to get it across three columns, we say the start column is one and the end column is four. Well, there is no column four, right? There's only three columns. So you go one higher than the column that you want it to do. Um, one thing that you notice and you were kind of hinting at, uh, you can actually apply multiple classes to an item simply by putting a space between them. So this element is both a member of the box A class and a member of the, oh, I'm sorry, the element of the box class and a member of the class A. So you can, and then both the style rules will apply. All right. 
So if we wanted B to go across two rows, I could say grid row start, grid row and Yeah, you're right. Two. Thank you. There we go. That's what I wanted. So it starts at two, it goes to three, and it ends at four, which there is no four, so that's where it ends. So you can see by playing around with this, we can make our grid kind of any way that we want to. All right, simply by making the row span and the column span. Now, if you look at these examples that are here on Canvas, there's a lot more examples of how you can renumber things, and you can assign grid rows and columns and positions if you want to rearrange it. So this is a very flexible tool to have. Uh, what I did in this one example, which I didn't do the regular prototype with this, but I did do... Um, a grid example is I've sort of done the standard what we've been doing having a banner going across the page having navigation down the side and having a footer on the bottom, but I've done it using the grid layout. The one thing that this offers that the other one doesn't is this does a very easy way to make sure that the columns are, are even with the grid layout. Okay, so let's go and look at what I did for this. First of all, the one little bit of change that I have to do is I have to put sort of a wrapper around everything to indicate that, yeah, this is going to be a grid. Everything inside this is going to be a grid. So my header, nav, section, and so on, everything inside that is going to be within the grid. So all of those block elements are going to be arranged in a grid. And by default, they're going to take up one row and one column, unless I specify otherwise. So I look at the CSS for this, and I define the wrapper as being a grid. I put the gap between them as 10 pixels, and I put the template columns as 20, 30, and 30. I then don't need to do anything for any of the other elements except the header, nav and the footer. Because the header, nav, and footer, I don't want to just span one row and one column. The header, I want to span the first three columns, so I use grid column start, grid column end. The nav, I do grid row start of two, grid row end of five, and then finally the footer, I do column start one, column end four. And so we achieve this sort of look with that. Now, I should be able to center the wrapper if I want by just doing what we've done before and just saying margin 0px auto. All right. Yeah, you could. You, you, it, it, you, you could. Sometimes I guess to be a little bit involved and complicated, but yeah, you're, you're right. You could do that. 
And notice that this is based on percentages, so as we make it bigger and smaller, it makes it bigger and smaller. Now, one thing I want to point out, though, if we view this in Internet Explorer, it doesn't look right. All right? If we view this in Microsoft Edge, it doesn't look right. If we, if we view it in Chrome, however, it does look right. When we start using some of the newer tools in the language, whether it be CSS or HTML, we have to worry about browser compatibility. Now, I, I happen to know both these machines have very old versions of Edge and, and Internet Explorer. There is a resource available called Can I Use that shows the browser support for HTML5 and CSS3. So this shows me what versions of browsers support it. So, Internet Explorer 6 through 9 does not support that. So, my guess is that we're running Let's see what version of Internet Explorer we are running. Eleven, interesting. Eleven, if you notice, is sort of this, I don't know what you'd call that, olive green? It's a different color, shade of green. That means that it's not fully supported. That means that some things work, some things don't work. All right? And again, you need to put in dash ms dash in front of it for it to work. It's a little hard to read there, but it shows you that. It also shows you the global percentage of people that use it. And in this case, it's 2.04%. This is only 0.22%. If you look at Edge, it looks like later versions support it, older versions do not. But it's only partially, right? Um, so this is something that is useful. Uh, what happens if a browser doesn't support something? You sort of have to decide what to do. Um, I guess it depends on what it looks like. Um, it's OK if your page doesn't look the same in every browser. That's the goal, of course, to have your pages look identical regardless of what browser that you're on. But the practical reality is sometimes you're going to run into cases where it doesn't. And you have to decide, well, is it acceptable? Is it still usable? Is it still workable? And if it is, then it might be OK to leave it like that. Otherwise, there's different workarounds that you can do to get it, or you go with a different strategy. It does show you the number of people that have that particular version of the browser, if that helps you make the decision. All right. Questions about that? The other question we're going to look at, or the other thing that we're going to look at, is the flex view. Let's look at this guy first. I don't remember what this one is. Oh, I essentially just I use the grid view to make the, 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 the exact same layout that we had in the other one, where we have a banner. That's pretty straightforward. Let me look and see if I could find a flex example.
Okay, let's, uh, let's just build one. We'll take the Star Wars one and we will build it. But let's look up the flex view. All right. The flex box works like this. All right. In this example, we have, I've defined the flex container as being a div, and I've specified stuff in between it, and I've specified no wrap. All right. So the flex container will put everything on the same line without wrapping it. If I specify wrap, what it will do is it will, if there's not enough room to put it on the page, it'll wrap it down below like that. So. Let's go and let's play with our Star Wars example and we'll use the uh, Flexbox method. So let's open up the main CSS. And I'm going to define the wrapper a little differently. I'm going to say dis display flex. And I'll say with 75% minimum with 600 pixels. So if we look at the index page now, It puts everything going across. All right. Because the default is no wrap. All right. Because the default is no wrap, and because I've not given a width to any of these things, these grid columns don't matter anymore because we're not using the grid layout. I'm going to get rid of all the widths. We're going to start from scratch. If you notice on the footer, I had the row start attribute. But we're back to this. OK, fits everything together on one page, because I have not specified any widths. If I specify wrap, it will wrap the boxes. So I'll say flex wrap. Wrap. Now if I look at the page. It'll look like that. All right. So what's it doing? It's kind of fitting in where the stuff can, and it is wrapping everything down below. I must not have gotten rid of all the widths. Wrapper. Oh, no, it's basing it on content, it must be. Yeah, it's basing it must, uh, uh, based on content. And it's fitting in what it can. It can't fit in next to it, so it drops it down below. So it's almost like floating.
But then I can play with the width to get this the way that I want it to. I could say something like header width 100%, order width 100%, and that spaces those out. I could give the nav a width of 20% and then give each section a width of 60%. and achieve pretty much the look that I want. And it resizes itself and so on. play with these a little bit. Let's give a width of 400 pixels on this. Make it a little smaller. It fits that alongside of it, but the others it drops below. So it's sort of like floating. Um, let's make each of these, make each section and this All right. Whereas the navigation's here, and each section is down below it. As it gets smaller, it will resize those to make them smaller. If I were to put a minimum width in them, it would honor that minimum width. So if I made a minimum width on the nav, Two hundred pixels. I'll do the same thing as a section. Notice how with this, the layout is two columns on a wider screen. As we get narrower, it drops to one column. That's a very typical sort of thing on web designs that work for mobile devices, is that if you're viewing them on a wider screen, you get a two-column appearance. If you are viewing them on a narrower screen, you get a one-column appearance. We could change the header and the padding a little bit to Let's 
ていない。You get the idea. So, we have a one view on a wider screen, a different view on a narrower screen. And this is possible with the flex box. If you go to the W3 Schools resource, there's a lot of different examples. So notice that without, with no wrap, it puts it side by side. If you say wrap, it wraps it so it fits it in. You have a direction to either make things go vertically or horizontally. So this, the flex goes, stacks them vertically. You could change it to go horizontally if you wanted it to be a row. And so on. You can work these examples. You can reverse them if you want. And so on. We could, if we say wrap reverse, What that's going to do is that is going to put the navigation on the other side of the page. So if we do wrap reverse, oh, surprisingly, it put it way down there at the bottom. And there are a lot of other options that you can see to change, to change exactly the way that it looks. So these last two are newer elements of CSS, all right? And therefore, um, you would need to be concerned about browser compatibility. Let's see what happens if we try to view this in Internet Explorer. Again, we're kind of back to that. Which I'm surprised it looks this bad. I would have thought that it would have had some of its other properties, but um, I'm not really sure why it looks that bad. I would, I would think that some of the older CSS properties would have, uh, would have worked. All right, now, this points out an important issue that will become more important as we go forward. And that is that you need to test your code on as many different platforms as possible to make sure that it works. All right? It's not enough just to test it in one browser and say you're done. You should test it across multiple browsers. Ideally, you would test across multiple versions of browsers, like not just the current version of Chrome, but an older version of Chrome. Large organizations have testing labs where they have machines set up with different versions of the browsers so that you could test it. You should test on Mac versus PC. You should test on mobile versus desktop. Now, next time, we'll start talking about uh, making your page optimized for mobile devices, all right, which is uh, a, an important concern. Another important concern is to make sure you followed the language HTML and CSS correctly, all right? Unfortunately, that's not enough to guarantee that your page is going to look correct across all browsers because browsers have bugs. Browsers don't implement some of the features. But what we have is we have, a, we have a way of validating our web pages to make sure that 
we haven't broken any of the rules of the language. And now would be a good idea to start validating your pages. So if you go to w3c.org, not to be confused with W3 schools, this is the organization that is responsible for defining HTML, CSS. These are the bosses of the web. All right. And they have a page for validators. And you can validate by putting in the, the address of a website or upload a file, or you can just paste your code in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to take one of my HTML files. And I'm going to copy it at all. And I'm going to paste it in here. Then I'm going to run the check. And what this is doing is, is, is pretty much like doing a grammar check on your page. It's like in Word when you run a spell check or a grammar check. And it's looking for errors in the language. And it's given me, it didn't give me any errors, but it gave me some warnings. And sometimes the warnings are a little bit hard to understand. Sometimes they're straightforward. Here, it's suggesting I add a language attribute to my page. Well, I can do that by saying lang equals en. Here it's telling me not to use an H1 tag here. Tell me to use H2 tags for these. So I'll go and change all the H1s to H2s. I can run it again. And there's no errors or warnings. This, unfortunately, doesn't guarantee that my page will be compatible across all browsers. Because if it's an old browser that doesn't have some of the newer features in it, it won't work. But this is a good start of my validating my pages. So, once you have a template finished, it's a good idea to go back and run the validation. We'll talk a little bit more about this next time, all right? Because I did, I wanted to introduce it today, uh, and we'll talk more about it next time, uh, and give you some tips about reading the errors and understanding them. Because the errors, the messages that it give are not always is not always very straightforward. It will give you sometimes very cryptic error messages. All right, that's all I had for today. Next time we'll talk more about the validator and we'll talk about mobile web pages. All right, see you up in lab.